Today's episode of What's the Big Idea is brought to you by Choice. You made a great choice to check out this podcast. And as humans, we crave choice in our work, play, and learning. When educators are given choice in the what and the how of their teaching, they are more satisfied and productive. And when students are given choice, they feel more ownership over their work and develop their autonomy. Is your school talking about choice? Choice. Check it out today. Now on to the show. Yeah, it doesn't matter if anything you say in an AP English essay is accurate or true. Uh, In fact, I I wrote an essay about this on my blog. Um, I got so bored with the practice essays. um, I was going to write about uh, a Catcher in the Rye and a separate piece. I couldn't write about Catcher in the Rye anymore. On the fly during the AP exam, I invented a novel. (laughs) Gave it a name, gave it characters, gave it a plot. Um, I borrowed from a bunch of books, like I cobbled a bunch of my favorite books together yeah. into it. Um, I just did it because I was so bored in the moment to like yeah. keep myself writing. I yeah. got a five because, and later I learned, you know, when you see what grading the AP exam takes, yeah. it's, like, you know, it's, it's like they don't have time to, no. particularly back then, there's no internet. They couldn't go Google, like, I've never heard of this book. Right. It was it, yeah. it it had to resemble it was a Potemkin essay. It was exactly what I talked about it in the book. It resembled yeah. an essay, therefore, um that kid can write, therefore he deserves a five. It, it's yeah. it's it's sad. Thanks for checking out What's the Big Idea? I'm your host, Dan Carney. The voice you just heard is John Warner, writer, editor, speaker, teacher, and consultant, who recently published the excellent Why They Can't Write and the writer's practice. I had a chance to speak with John and you'll be hearing that full interview in a few minutes. Our conversation was about writing in schools. Like math and reading, writing occupies that hollowed ground of being one of the most debated and talked about facets of education today. As a New York Times article in 2017 put it, there's a virulent debate about which approach is best. If you follow education discussions online or in edu publications, you're familiar with the debate over writing. I mean, heck, even a few days ago, an Ed Week Spotlight report landed in my email inbox. It has articles with titles like The Problems with Literacy Programs and Want Young Students to Love Writing? Let Them Play With It. Its range of authors agreed on at least one thing. Writing is a vital skill that schools need to get right. But what does getting it right look like? Now is a great time to read the full title of one of Warner's recent books, Why They Can't Write, Killing the Five-Paragraph Essay and Other Necessities. Well, that certainly caught my attention. See, for years I've been noticing something, something I would describe as the sterilization of student writing in schools. When I first started noticing this, it didn't really jump out at me. I was teaching history in the IB Diploma, a program that specializes in pushing students to the edge of their abilities and sanity. In the two-year history course, students learn, or rather absorb, an incredible amount of content knowledge, which they are then asked to deploy in a series of timed essays. At its most insane, the tests ask students to write three essays in a single two and a half hour session. Even as I was teaching it, I thought this approach was absurd. What historian works like this? What is this writing really accomplishing other than feeding into the machine of college applications where everything is on the clock? But honestly, I accepted it as part of the deal. I was right there with my students, pushing them to get the best scores so they could go to the best universities for them. It was when I began teaching middle school students that I became alarmed at the writing I was being asked to assign and those assignments I was seeing in other classes. In short, none of those assignments were about true writing. They were about the structure. They were about citations. And they were on topics that no middle school student on earth would find interesting. And this wasn't confined to middle school. Teachers I spoke with in upper elementary had similar stories. 
So excerpts like this from Warner's book really caught my eye. He writes, quote, when students hear essay, they think five paragraphs written to impress teacher, mostly to show that the student has been paying attention in class and or doing the reading. Make sure to cite sources because plagiarism. Also, use block quotes because that looks good and eats up the word count. Don't forget the conclusion that summarizes everything, starting with in conclusion. Never use I. Contractions, bad. Why? Too informal? Why is informal bad? Because this is why most essays are unpleasant for students to write and boring or frustrating for instructors to read. They are treated not as an occasion to discover something previously unknown, to the author above all, but a performance for an audience of one, the teacher, one hoop among many to be jumped through as part of the college grind. Following the high school grind, students are so versed in this pattern, they do it on autopilot, and college instructors like me grouse about kids these days and their lack of dedication to their work." Close quote. So you can hear from that excerpt that Warner teaches college students. And so he sees the culmination of elementary, middle, and high school writing as it comes up into uh, the college ranks. But Warner is not simply an academic that's sitting in his office lecturing the world about college students. One aspect of his career that we didn't get to in our interview is his work with McSweeney's. You're probably at least a little familiar with McSweeney's, Dave Eggers' publication house that's responsible for many print and online works, including the 826 Valencia Project, which helps underserved students develop their writing skills. From 2003 to 2008, John Warner edited McSweeney's Internet Tendency, the publisher's humor and satire website, and he now serves as a contributing editor. So when you hear Warner talking about the power of the idea and the notion that idea is more important than rigid structures, he's someone who practices what he preaches. Okay, let's get to the interview with John Warner. Back in 10 seconds. Okay, now I'd like to welcome on the podcast, John Warner, writer, editor, speaker, teacher, and a consultant who currently teaches as an affiliate faculty at the College of Charleston, South Carolina. He's the author of several books, most recently, Why They Can't Write, Killing the Five Paragraph Essay and Other Necessities. John Warner, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's great to be here. Thanks so much. Um, I wonder if we could start. There's so much in this book I want to get to. I, I really, a lot of it really spoke to me as a middle school teacher, as a parent, and as someone who's just spent a lot of time uh, thinking about writing and writing my own life. But I thought we could start talking about your own educational journey uh, as a student uh, and then moving on into the realm of academia as faculty. What's that been like? What, how's your view of writing itself changed since you were a student? Yeah, it's interesting. So in uh, Why They Can't Write, I have an anecdote about uh, my third grade teacher, Mrs. Goldman, who uh, gave us an experience that first alerted me to the fact that I was a writer, that we are all writers. Um, she had us make uh, write instructions for making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And then she um, required us to try to make the sandwiches following our own instructions to the letter. Um, and we had left all kinds of things out, like the amounts of the ingredients or using a knife to spread it on the bread and, and this kind of stuff. In fact, I have a picture of me doing this, of shoving my hand into the jar of peanut butter because I didn't say you could use a knife. And I had a, a you know, a literal epiphany where it's like, oh, this stuff matters. The idea is to, is to make something that is of use to the person who's receiving it. Mm -hmm. We have an audience, we have a purpose, and we have a message. We have, there's, the rhetorical situation exists. Um, so that started the journey, and, and kind of through um, middle school, my own middle school experience, and, and uh, I graduated from high school in 1988, so that's sort of the 70s and then into the 80s. Um, I, writing was simply a pleasure. Um, it, it was a, a um, way to engage with the world and my own thoughts and explore ideas 
Um, once I hit high school, it became a little more instrumentalist, like taking AP English, you have to write a, an essay that's going to pass muster, and that has to fit into a certain template, and that I didn't particularly love, but I could do just fine because I, I had developed you know, a sort of flexible writing process. Hmm. College, I was a bit of an indifferent student, um, you know, B student for the most part. Um, but I did really fall pretty hard for fiction writing, creative writing, and ended up majoring that in college. Um, but still had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Mm. Um, but I would go to law school. I was an English major uh, and um, worked at a law fo- school for a couple of years, or worked at a law firm for a couple of years after school. And that's where I started writing short stories at my desk during my spare time, or sometimes not my spare time Mm -hmm. at work. Um, So I decided to go back to school um, for an MFA in creative writing, and that's when I started teaching writing. And that sort of started the journey of um, really thinking about writing from, not just as a writer, but as somebody who's trying to help other writers write. Um, And that's kind of just turned into a, a... She's 25 plus year journey. I guess I started graduate school 25 years ago last fall. So it's, it's mm-hmm. been a while. Yeah. The, the peanut butter and jelly story that you tell, I, I enjoyed that. And there's, it, it, it's in the vicinity of this chapter in your book called making writing meaningful by making writing meaningful. And mm-hmm. there's a, there's a, almost a checklist of nine uh, items that, you say sort of drive your work and you say it's similar to being a chef and just to give the listener a a few examples um i am passionate about my subject i have an audience potentially interested in reading my writing Uh, i am likely to learn something via my writing that i did not previously know and I, i was struck reading this that how much better your basic school writing assignment would be if teachers compared the task to these nine items and, and, and you talk about, in, in the book, you make this great uh, statement about Potemkin essays, or you said, I think once in an interview, that people are assigning writing-related simulations as opposed to writing. Um, and how, how would you compare what, what students are receiving in school today against your sort of your nine uh, sort of benchmark? Uh, yeah, a, a lot of the writing I think students do in school today is for the purposes of, of doing school. Hmm. Um, as opposed to, let's say, some, something like learning um, or exploration or um, those sorts of values. So often that um, incentivizes a kind of short-circuiting of the writing process where we will provide a template like the five-paragraph essay mm-hmm. or even prescriptions inside the template like um, start your first paragraph with this, uh, start your last paragraph with the words in conclusion to signal your conclusion. Yeah. And the process um, is really to demonstrate a kind of surface level um, engagement with, say, a text where you're parroting certain things back that signal to the, the teacher, hey, I read that and kind of understood it and can, can go through some moves that signal that. But it doesn't have exploration. Um, one of those points you mentioned in my list about discovered something I didn't know before, that is the chief pleasure of writing for me. And that I sit down with an idea or even something smaller than an idea, often something like what I call a notion, um, half an idea, a partial idea. And I tease it out. I explore it until it becomes something that um, I have discovered that I didn't know before. Um, Mm -hmm. That is the process of writing. I, I see writing as thinking, as the process of thinking, and where those things are short circuited in school assignments, where we prescribe uh, a a template for format or where we box students in in terms of subject or making them write about subjects in which they are not interested and have no knowledge. I I think that begins to draw them away from the things that are pleasurable pleasurable about writing and will get them to persist at writing. Um, That's a big part of being a writer is is doing writing, (laughs) is is to spend time writing. and, And To ask a student to sort of flog an essay that they have limited interest in and are really just doing for the purposes of getting a grade is, uh, it's a big ask. I I could never do it as a student, even as an enthusiastic reader 
American writer from a very young age. Um, so to think that that is a system that's going to work broadly for students, I think, is mistaken. Yeah, you at one point in your book, you write that the sentence is not the basic skill or fundamental unit of writing. The idea is even for a teacher who's sitting, maybe sitting at home, listening to this, agreeing, nodding their head to that, that ideas are the most powerful part of writing. How do teachers get there? How do they move away from this rather rigid structure we've developed where the, the format seems to be the, the driver of all writing? How do we get past that to the, to the idea? Yeah, so that's where um, I frame writing as an experience. In fact, I have a companion book to, to Why They Can't Write called The Writer's, uh, the Writer's Practice, a book of writing experiences, which sort of puts these things into, um, into uh, I don't use the word assignment, but they're assignments, uh, assignments as experiences. And what I try to think through as I, as I built and continue to build these things, because I, I haven't stopped creating writing experiences, is what are the things that I want students to um, do along the way that will help them learn? And those are rooted in what I call the writer's practice, the skills, attitudes, knowledge, and habits of mind of writers. Mm -hmm. And so the goal is to have an experience that touches on the writer's practice, that invokes the writer's practice. And so doing those things is what's important. The, the product is important only as it's a thing that allows the doing. And so a lot of that for, for teachers, I think, means letting go of notions of, I have to train students to write a good essay about a book. Mm -hmm. um, it's more, I need to get students thinking about um, this text that we read, be it a, a book or, or something shorter, um, and then expressing ideas that they have created in the context of this book. Um, one of the one of the recent examples, um, some other teachers have sent me on Twitter, sort of working off of some of the things I talk about in why they can't write in the writer's practice, is a narrative argument um, where uh, they ask students to embody the role of a character in a book and um, have to sort of figure out how a particular character would, would behave or act based on their interpretation of, of the story and the character. Um, that is a deep, um, complicated act of analysis worthy of any literary scholar. Um, it will not take the form of a quote unquote school essay. But if our goal is to have students think about literature and, and understand literature more deeply, as just as one example, it's a more than worthy assignment. So it's really about what do I want my students to experience? What do I want them to know? What sort of attitudes do I want to reinforce about writing? And what sorts of habits of mind, things like curiosity or um, uh, stick to itiveness, like that they really want to work it until they get it right. That's a, a habit of mind of good writers. Um, I think of those things before I design the assignment, and then I see if the assignment is embodying those values. Yeah, looking over your habits of mind, a couple of things struck me. Was One was that there's a lot of overlap with what is commonly referred to as 21st century skills or, or soft skills. I thought they were, and also that uh, secondly, they can't be quantified or it's mm -hmm. difficult to quantify them. And I think that makes them a bit slippery for schools because we want to quantify the thing uh, so that there can be a grade. Uh, do, you, do you agree with that notion? No, for sure. I mean, the the one of the challenges, and I talk about this and why they can't write too, is these sort of systemic barriers we have to changing our, our pedagogical practices. And the desire for quantification and measurement, I think, is a big one. And um, it can be very, very difficult, particularly for teachers, you know, in the in the middle school, high school grades, where you can be and may be assessed on those things, um, particularly in public um, institutions. Um, I think it's it's important to push back on those notions to show that there's value in non-quantifiable data. Um, I am uh, I mentioned I'm a consultant. I'm, I'm a um, analyst and strategist for a market research firm, and we use qualitative data all the time to make 
sound decisions um, and recommend things to our, our clients who are making decisions. Um, I'm a believer in asking students um, strategic questions around what they're learning. Um, as simple as what do you know now that you didn't know before you did this assignment? This reveals things that they learned. What can you do now that you could not do before you um, engaged with this assignment or experience? Um, and, and I see it, you know, when, when uh, people are using uh, both books, and, and the, including the writer's practice, and, um, you know, I, I ask them to write narratives uh, about what they experienced, you know, who, and one of the, one of the questions I'm looking, I'm looking at this thing now because I'm, I'm doing a, I'm doing a talk on Saturday from South Carolina Council for Teachers of English. And, um, uh, it was written to by a, a um, tutoring program that used um, some experiences from the writer's practice for one week and then asked at the end, who are you now as a writer? And students said things like, um, my attitudes right towards writing have changed. I used to be writing as something stressful, but now I've learned steps to make it easier. My writing process has also altered. I used to just start writing, but now I have learned that pre-writing plays a crucial role. Mm -hmm. That's a student who, in a week's time, has learned about the writing process. Um, that is not quantifiable, perhaps, but it's data and it's real. Um, and I think we can. It's tougher to quantify, but I do think we can. We can. Um, we can measure them in different ways. We can bring them to life. We, yeah. we can make them apparent in the world. All right. You mentioned teachers, you, you go, you consult and you speak to teachers. Uh, I want to read you a line from a 2017 article in the New York Times. Dana Goldstein was writing about uh, sort of the debate over writing in America. And she wrote, the root of the problem, educators agree, is that teachers have learned how to teach writing and are often weak or unconfident writers themselves. Uh, uh, does that sound, does that ring true with your experience that um, teachers are not prepared to teach writing? I, I think it can be true. Um, I don't think the notion that this is the chief problem, I think, is false. Um, and to the extent that um, teachers may feel um, that they lack confidence as writers, um, I think that is more around what we have decided matters around writing in school. Um, I, I, um, I think we all have a writer inside of us. Even if we don't write, we think. Yes, we Descartes, I think, therefore I am. Mm -hmm. And where people have trouble moving from, from thinking to writing is believing that there's something fundamentally different about writing, writing, like we get bound up in notions of like correctness or there's a right way to write rather than that it's a, a communicative act done by human beings, um, usually for the benefit of other human beings. And if we can embrace that notion, um, not only for students, but for ourselves as instructors, um, I think that confidence, if that's a problem, um, would begin to um, be solved. Um, but really, I mean, in, in the end, uh, it, it is not harmful in teaching students to write to reveal to them the extent to which all of us also struggle with writing. One of my favorite things to do with my students, and these are, are college freshmen, are to bring in first drafts of um, like blog posts I wrote for Inside Higher mm -hmm. Education. And I show them the draft of it, and they are um, amused, horrified. I don't know what the right word is. Um, as I show them all my mistakes, my typos, my bad phrasing, my nonsensical sentences, the half-baked ideas. Um, and it, it's deeply reassuring to them to know that all of us experience this as we write. The difference between me and perhaps uh, my students who are less experienced are I have many, many more hours taking that raw material and shaping into something for an audience. Um, they tend to think that it come, once you're a writer, it just comes out of you as though it is flowing from a bottomless well or a, uh, you know, a, a, 
a waterfall that just the brilliance cascades from, and I want to disabuse them of that notion. So if, if teachers are out there thinking like, I'm not a good writer, so I can't teach writing, I, I think that's mistaken. I, I think you can embody the same learner mentality as your students and, and work alongside them. I do, um, you know, and, and I'm a, a working writer. So I think we can all sort of achieve this. Yeah, you're describing uh, describing modeling to a large extent. Yeah. It's just so yeah. important. It's no matter what we're teaching, it's so important to, for the kids to see that and to see our own vulnerabilities. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I was really happy in the book when you to see that you talked about portfolios. Um, I, I had a conversation last year with a high school in Durango, Colorado called Animus that has one of the centerpieces of the school was a digital portfolio. The students keep the whole their whole school tenure. Um, why are portfolios important? Why are they perhaps a better way of measuring a writer uh, than this than the standard traditional tasks with grades that we get? Yeah. The, the a portfolio, a, a record of writing, right? Mm -hmm. like here, here are the artifacts that I created during a certain period of time it is great for a lot of reasons. One is it's a tool for reflection in the immediate sense. Students can look over what they did in a semester and you can ask them, as I ask them, who are you now as a writer? At the beginning of the semester, I say, who are you as a writer? They often don't have a good answer. They don't per perceive themselves to be writers. Um, even the, the ones who got A's in writing tend to not express a lot of confidence as writers, like they're good at school, but they don't think a lot about writing. Um, so it, it has that um, benefit. Um, they can be a source for, I, I keep copies of all of my students' writing, you know, because you can download it from the LMS. Okay. And so I can go back and look at these things over time and see, you know, it, when I did the experience this way, what happened? When I do the experience this way, what happened? And even more for students, I think is over time, like if you can look back on what you produced in middle school when you were in high school or in college, like what you did in high school, or, or for me, one of the things I read about in the book is my um, master's thesis that at the time I was really confident was like, let, like, yeah send these stories to the New Yorker and let's wait for my literary fame to come in. Uh, you know, even five years later, I was like, oh, oh, that's why I wasn't getting anything published. And 20 years later, um, I can look, you know, five years after I looked back with sort of shame, uh, 20 years later, I look back with a certain fondness for who that person was mm. at the time, the concerns I had as a person, the things I wrote about, how I wrote about them. And to be able to see, particularly because writing is a struggle, I still do struggle with writing, um, particularly to see that I know that I've gotten better as a writer of, to isolate this one thing, fiction in the last 25 years. And I can pinpoint the specific ways by looking at the things I did 20 or 25 years ago. Yeah. It, it, it allows us to embody a notion that we as writers are, are living beings and writing is one of the things we do and, and we should um, not treat these things as disposable once a grade is put on them. And mm. we say, ooh, there's my B, done with that forever. And um, these things can and should live beyond the grade. Yeah, it's, it's a good transition to talk a bit about feedback. Uh, you have this great description in the book that I think every teacher would agree with. The You, you spend the time giving the feedback, and they, just, they flip to the last page, look at the grade, and it's almost like that's it. That that yeah. is now closed. What advice can you give teachers about constructive feedback that students can use to uh, make progress in their writing? Yeah. So a lot of this for me evolved when I changed just my approach to the assignments, to the experiences. When I started to privilege the journey, the experience, um, my feedback became much more formative, much less evaluation, much less trying to justify the grade. That then led me to um, simply embrace a full kind of ungraded um, approach where I don't put any letter grade on the writing ever during the course of the semester. Um, I, I use a grading contract. It, it varies by course. Um, in some courses, though, like in, when I teach fiction writing, one of the most important parts of the grading contract is simply the number of words they wrote that semester. Um, 
because if, if they're going to improve as fiction writers, you just got to get in there and just write, 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 write. If, if in an introductory fiction writing class, you're probably not going to write something publishable, but that's not our goal. Our goal is to roll around in the, in the uh, problem of trying to write a satisfactory uh, story. So if you can, I'm ungraded and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be an evangelist for it on why you should not put letter grades on, on writing and how it creates much better incentives around what you do. Um, that said, I'm also a strong believer in instructor autonomy that, that instructors have to sort of do what, what works for them. What I will say and how I got there is at the very least, make sure that what you're grading resonates with your values. What you think is important in a piece of writing um, for something like um, parenthetical citation of sources in a, in a research paper and the, the proper formatting. Over time, I realized like, I just don't care. I don't care. I don't care. Um, I don't, it's not important to me. And I don't think it's important to the, often to the rhetorical power of the writing. And so I stopped caring. They could use MLA, they could use APA, they could use Chicago style, they could use APA, I don't care. Um, I need consistency. Um, I need the principles of, of um, effective citation and that your reader needs to be able to go find your source and see that it's true and accurate. But as long as they're thinking through the problem of citation and using that, I don't care what's in or out the parentheses or where the comma or the periods are. It's just not important to me. That's my advice is sort of, if it doesn't feel important to you, don't grade it. Don't assess it. Yeah. Citation is, is, it's one of those things that just, some people really latch onto it and it mm -hmm. becomes all about the citation. And after a yeah. while, I think, gosh, what, they'll, they'll begin to think that's the most important thing in the essay. Right. You, you use the word autonomy. What, how powerful is choice, both for the student and for the teacher, in crafting uh, good writing? It's, for me, it's like the whole thing. Um, when students are allowed to explore topics of their own interest, or even better, their own interest and expertise, they will write better. Um, a lot of that is because they will spend more time, they'll care more, and they'll be more passionate about it. Um, and with instructors, um, you know, a big part, you, you read the book, a, a big part of my concern about the book are these systemic pressures on teachers that remove them from these um, direct human relationships with their students. Um, we should not be treating all our students as though they are an interchangeable mass. And so for me, instructors at all levels, need that freedom to engage with students at that level. Um, and that's where choice comes in. Um, not every class is the same. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure you've experienced this as well. Uh, I've had semesters where I taught the exact same class back to back to back to back. It's the same, it's the freshman students, it's the same course. I've got the same plan and could not have had more different experiences, you know, half an hour apart. And, and if I'm bound up to um, restrictions around content or um, assessment, I am doing the students that are not responding to this as well a disservice. If I don't have that freedom of choice, then um, the experience for all of us is, is degraded. Yeah, that's 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 like every day in middle school. <laughs> of course, it's the the the, the 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 period to period changes, and and the students, you know, they're so influenced by not just what they read, but the the class discussions. Mm -hmm. And so class discussions, though, those vary so much class to class, and sometimes you go off on tangents in one class that you never even approach in another, and then the writing is different, and yeah. And you never know which kid's gonna like one kid, one the same kid on a Tuesday can show up on a Wednesday and be a different kid. Like they have, they, they are they're in a mood or they experience something that has changed their mind or who, who knows. And to sort of not allow for that to happen, I think, I and mean, that's the fun part of teaching is to see students light up and transform. So to um, take things off the table that would help us do that, I just think, I, I don't understand it. I, I don't know how we started going down this road in, in education. I wish we would turn back. I hope we turn back, but um, 
uh, if we don't, you know, I think we're really doing students a disservice. Was, was there a moment when you realized you were going to write this book or these books with the writer's practice? You know, you've been working with college students for a while now. Was, was there sort of a, a crystallizing moment when you, you, there, know, you were, were? Yeah, there was not maybe one moment, but there were maybe two or three. Um, one was, one was I became increasingly concerned about the apparent amount of anxiety and, and students felt around school. Um, anxiety and um, I think depression coupled with that. I I had a, a, a moment in class where in, in my office after class, uh, where I said to a student, a, a, a freshman in college, a young woman, and I said, I clapped my hands and I said, only two weeks left of school. Like excited, like, hey, we're almost done. And she burst into tears. And um, she, she, she felt bad and I felt bad. I'm like, you know, I didn't mean to do that. What's going on? She's like, I just feel so much like when you, I feel so much pressure at school. And when you said, said that, I just realized like, there's no way I'm going to get everything done. And, and that was probably, that was probably nine or 10 years ago now that I, that I think about that incident. I was like, what is going on? Why is it a college freshman, you know, having a, a, a emotional breakdown just over like how much work she's doing? Um, the other, the other key part was I would do an exercise in my first year writing class. I would do this on the second day and I'd say, how, how many of you, um, if I gave everybody in class an A, you have to do no work. We never see each other again after this day, but you're getting A. Um, how many of you would take that deal? And, and it was up to like 80, 85%. Um, and I, we would talk about it. I'm like, you're not going to learn anything. Like, <laughs> like we're never going to see each other again. We're, we're going our separate ways. You can't tell anybody because we'll all get in trouble. Hypothetical, it's pure hypothetical, of course. Um, but, uh, you're not going to learn anything. You're going to learn nothing about sort of writing or any of the, any of the assignments that and I, I had explained the whole semester, the, the previous period and like, yeah, no, we're good. We're good. Uh, we'll, we'll take the A. Um, now I would ask why, um, you know, people who think it's because students are lazy. It's it's not that. It's like, oh, an A is an A. Mm -hmm. Like A is really worth something. Or um, not only do I get an A, I can spend more time on my other courses and then get more A's. Or I can pick up an extra shift at work that will allow me to, um, you know, have a little extra money or, or not have to borrow as much. And what I began to realize and saw in many different places was that school had become kind of fundamentally hostile to students' well-being. And um, that was showing up in their, in their attitudes towards writing, towards school in general, but especially towards writing. You know, the, all the students in that class were conscripts. It's a required course. They wouldn't have signed up for it if they didn't have to take it. And I wanted to just explore that more. And that was probably, uh, you know, it's probably about three or four years where I just put my antenna up and started seeing all of these other phenomenon that I, that I started to think were related to, to what's going on. And I got really concerned about those systemic things that are happening that I think are damaging students. And while I recognize that a book by itself is not going to undo systemic problems, although I, I try to offer some some at least directional change. Um, as long as those things are going on, there are um, interventions in our teaching that I think can help mitigate the damage sure. as much as possible. I, and I think there is a certain individual obligation at that level. I just want to end on this question here. What, what, uh, what single piece of advice would you give uh, a teacher who's taking on writing in his or her classroom that, that, would stem the tide of that uh, school is just preparing for more school kind of. Uh, well, she's uh, I think the biggest thing, well, I'll, I'll go back to something I said earlier. Try to teach in a way that you think is in line with your, your goals and your values, what you wish for these young people um, in the world. And where you see something that seems out of whack, try to get around it, <laughs> you know? Um, if, if there's something that you think doesn't work, um, 
do your best not to do it. Um, no, you don't do anybody any favors by getting yourself fired or, or anything like that. But um, there does need to be some resistance and, and, and pushback. So um, believe in your own humanity and your students' own humanity. You don't really need to set those things aside. And, and um, feel free to reveal your humanity to your students. Um, I find um, you may be able to speak to this better for middle school students, but for college students, my students appreciate it when I, when I share these things. Um, uh, so, you know, be human. Be a human and recognize that those, those people in front of you are also humans. John Warner is the author of Why They Can't Write and the Writer's Practice. Whether you're a middle school teacher, uh, elementary school teacher, high school, college, highly recommend uh, these books. John, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, that was my really, part. Great, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks. A huge thanks to John Warner for taking the time to talk. What I really appreciate about Warner's thinking and his books is that it's all contextualized in the broader question of education's direction. He explores a number of themes that I find quite compelling. For example, student choice, resisting quantification, quality feedback, and the importance of teacher modeling. His focus remains on writing as a thinking process, not as a means of creating a product. And I just want to finish with one more thought about choice. In contrast to how it's often portrayed by some traditionalists, student choice does not mean students are dictating the curriculum any more than it means they are circling around the room deciding if they want to even learn that day. Rather, choice is a powerful tool at a teacher's disposal that, when used correctly, gives students a level of buy-in they might not ordinarily have. Writing provides many opportunities for choice. Considering text type, audience, and purpose are just a few ways we teachers can empower students through choice in their writing. In the meantime, teachers, I highly recommend you check out John Warner's work. The books are Why They Can't Write and The Writer's Practice, and I promise both of them will have you thinking about your own teaching and how you're using writing in the classroom and education in general. John Warner also uh, has a blog on Inside Higher Ed, and as I mentioned, he edits McSweeney's Internet Tendency, and as a site, if you haven't seen it, definitely worth checking out some very funny things, some very offbeat most definitely unstructured, uh, idea-driven humor over there at that website. Thanks for checking out What's the Big Idea. Our music today was from Molo. Que Estranio S is the song. Check us out next time on What's the Big Idea. Yeah.